Man. Jesus, the victorious King. Yes, He is. Forever will be. Amen for sure. Y'all stand with us. We welcome you today. We want you to join with us as we begin this time of praise. Uh, I hope you've come expecting. Okay, are we, are we awake this morning? Yes. Hello. Little on the quiet side. So this is your chance to begin and sing and uh, lift his name up high. You have something to celebrate. That's the name of Jesus and all that he's done for each and every one of us. Amen? All right. Just simply talking about 
our wonder-working God, and uh, how that no matter what we've done, no matter what we might be facing as far as a challenge, an addiction, whatever the situation may be, He offers what we can can consider and, and seriously call miracle power. And I say that because anything that comes from Him is miracle power. Um, he is the supernatural one, and His strength is perfect. So we love what this song is saying.
to try to be perfect, that we are far from it, and uh, that's any one of us, and so we just are, are have the freedom to start wherever we need to start, so uh, I just hope and pray that through that song, you really grasp what the amazing message was, yes, miracle power. All right. <laughs> Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall All those lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground Friends I had were nowhere to be found. I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the search, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it, there was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kind of grace, forgiveness and a pride. I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. In the way, in the search, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment.
give him praise. Amen. our praise. Lord, we just thank you that we can come together and to lift up the name of the Lord God Almighty. Lord, we want you to continue to receive the praise this morning. 
through song, Lord. Lord, we know in a few moments we'll get to worship you through the word of God that will be spoken. Lord, we're so unworthy. So unworthy. I know all the worship team would say that we're all unworthy to do what we're doing, but God, you've given us the gifts and talents, and we just want to shine your light through what we're doing today. Thank you that your people, God, did they engage, they respond to worship, and Lord, I know they're here to lift you up. What a mighty God we serve. We just continue to praise you now, Lord. In the name of Jesus. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and he died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet.
Thank you, Jesus. God, I was sitting there listening to that line. Coming in hot. Coming in hot. Can't pray when I'm hot. <laughs> Sit there and listen to that line where it says that we're going to be gazed and transfixed on your face, Lord. What are we going to do? What are we going to say when we're standing right in front of you? I know one of the things that, that, that I'm going to want to say is, Lord, that my, my sin, my sin is so deep. But then you'll turn around and say, your grace is deeper. Our shame, our shame is just so wide, but then, Lord, your arms are wider. Our guilt. Our guilt is so great. But Jesus looking in your eyes will know that your love is greater. So Lord, I just thank you for the possibility to come and just be a part of what you're doing. Be a part of a group of people that is sending up praises to you. Thanking you for who you are and what you've done in our life. And what you're going to do in our life. How you've restored our families. How you're going to restore our families. How much more you're going to put your word in us, Lord. Well, we'll have those moments that we can speak life into somebody else. So, Lord, I pray right now that you would equip us. You would give us ears to hear. Get us out of that comfort zone, Lord. Share us your word. And Lord, whatever you do, don't let me mess it up. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 Well, good morning, y'all. Did you get you a chicken biscuit this morning? Get you a donut or something? Now you wish you had a... Now that I mentioned it, man, are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? That's what I'm talking about. If you have your Bible, let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Has anybody in here been pulled out of darkness into the light? Isn't that a blessing? Now you can see. You can see what's important to you now. We thought other things were important, but now we really see what's important because we can see. We can see. Revelation chapter 1. When you get there, say amen. amen. All right. If your neighbor's in Romans, tell them to keep going. Press on. You will get there. So in my Bible, this New King James here, it says revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you say that? What's going on? Y'all are... The revelation of who? Thank God. Revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> revelation of Jesus Christ. We don't need to know about John. We need to know about Jesus. <laughs> John's the one writing it. Think about that word revelation again. I, I want to make sure you understand this as you get into the word. That revelation means revealing. It is the opposite of a secret. It is the opposite of a mystery. It's the revealing of Jesus. It's the revealing of his heart. The revealing of his grace. Revealing of his love. Revealing of his peace, his plan. What he's wanting to do in your life and what he wants to do in my life. It's the revealing of Jesus. I, I think about when my, me and my boys, we play hide and go seek. Anybody still play hide and go seek? <laughs> the goal now is for them to eventually find me. 
Think about this. The goal is for, for, for our kids to eventually find us. Okay? We don't want to be hiding there all day, right? Maybe getting hot in there. We don't want to be like Bigfoot. They've never found him yet. Right? He's the, he's the champion of the world right now in hide and go seek. I wish somebody would find him. Give me some of that beef jerky. Amen. <laughs> right, yeah. But here's the thing. I want my boys to look hard for me because it's, it's in the searching, it's in the, it's in the perseverance, it's in the challenge to find daddy that, that, that they, that they want to find me that reveals something about their character. See, it's the seeking, it's the, it's the searching that reveals, you know, it's the, it's the effort, it's the effort that you put in in the searching that, that shows you how bad you want it, right? So technically, because I want them to find me, so technically I'm not really hiding from them, I'm hiding for them. Does that make sense? I'm not hiding, really hiding from them, I want them to find me because you want to reward the effort that they took to seek you out. So I say all that to say this, it's very similar in the Word of God that Jesus is right there. He's right there. But, but we need to want to find Him. Okay? And it's the effort that we put in. We, we need to put the effort in to find Him. Because the effort reveals how much we want Him. How much we seek Him. How bad we want to find Him. How bad do you want to find Jesus? Like when you're in them situations, you don't know what to do. How bad do you want the answer? Think about it for a minute. He says in Matthew 7, let's put it on the screen. He says, ask and it will be given. Seek, you're going to find. Okay, knock and it's going to be open to you. Notice those three things. Ask, seek, and knock. Those are all action things. He's wanting us to ask. And seek and knock according to his will. And we will find him. This is an awesome promise from Jesus. So when you read the Bible, not just the book of Revelation, but when you read the Bible in a whole, look for Jesus. Don't spend time looking for anything. Look for Jesus. Remember what he says in Hebrews 10, 7? He says that he comes in the volume of the book. He says, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. What does he say who it's written by? He said, It's written of him. It's written of him. It's written of him. I've got a book back there in the office called Rare Air. When you read that, you read about Michael Jordan, right? Because he was rare air, right? Nobody could dunk like like Jesus. Yeah, nobody could dunk like Jesus. Amen. Nobody can don't like Michael Jordan. Nobody can play like Michael Jordan. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing with the, with the Bible. You look for Jesus. Because here's the deal. When you see him in this book, when you see him in this book, then you'll learn to see him in everything and everywhere. Because Jesus is not just in the book. He's in everything and everywhere. Amen. Amen. John said when he started his gospel off, he didn't talk about, you know, the birth of Jesus or anything like that. He went back to the very beginning in John 1, 1, and he says, in the beginning was the Word. He said, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you got to think, well, what is the Word? What is the Word? If you drop down to verse 14, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, who is that? Jesus. So when you read that, you would say in the beginning was Jesus. You know, Jesus was God. Jesus was with God. Jesus is God. Jesus became flesh. He dwelt among us. This is his word. So this word right here, this word became flesh in Jesus. So when you see Jesus, he's the manifested word of God. Right? This word is walking and talking and loving. I hope this makes sense to you. So when you pick this up, you're picking up the heart of God. Amen? So, here's what I want to do today. I want to do a quick review, kind of where we're at to this point. If, if, you, if you've not been here, we've been studying the book of Revelation verse by verse. We've made it all the way to about middle ways of chapter 4. But I want, you to, I want to do a quick review today. And it's going to, we're going to come up on in this review, we're going to come up on something. We're going to come up on a rabbit trail today. Okay? Listen, we're studying the book of Revelation, right? 
But to study the book of Revelation, you've got to take some rabbit trails every once in a while. Because what I'm going to show you today is something that's going to, going to help you understand when we get to chapter 5. Okay? Make sense? So we're building up our foundation to make it further than where we are right now. All right? Make sense? Because here's the deal. Jeremiah 3.15 says this. God says, I'm going to give you shepherds, right? That's, going to, that's of his heart that will feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's my goal. I don't want you to come in here and shoot over your head. Y'all don't understand that guy. It's confusing. I don't want to ever be like that. I've sat under too many people that are like that, and I don't want to be like that myself. If there's anything you would ever understand, you come and you ask me, Brother Scott, what are you talking about, brother? And I will share you. Deal? Let's shake on it. All right. Fist bump. All right, here we go. Where did I tell you to go? Revelation. Okay, that's a good place, place to go when you're studying it. All right. Let's just start again in verse 1, chapter 1. Listen to what it says. The revelation of who? Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must, what? Shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant. Who? Oh, John. There's old John right there. Who bore witness. John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus to all things that he saw. And he's putting it in a book. He's putting it in a scroll, right? So verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads this thing, who hears the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Yes, it is. Why is Jesus giving this thing to John? Because he wants to tell everybody what's shortly going to take place. Okay? Making sense so far? Okay. But how did he get to talk to John? It's amazing how God works things out for his good. Okay? So John gets arrested for preaching Jesus. All right? And, and his punishment for being arrested for preaching Jesus was they're going to go out there and put him on an island in exile. Like, you ain't going to be around nobody. You can't preach Jesus over here anymore. You're on an island all by yourself. Right? So he's on an island. And guess what happens when you're on an island all by yourself? You can actually be still and know that he's God. <laughs> Some of you may need to do that coming soon. Maybe it's too, too much clutter on you right now. Go, get, get by yourself and be still and know that he's God. I think that's Psalm 46.10. Anyway, so when John is there on exile, Jesus has his undivided attention and that's where he speaks to him this book of Revelation. Okay? That's where he speaks. Because, you know, John thought he was going because he was in trouble. But Jesus was just positioning him to hear. See, a lot of us think that we're going through some things in our life and we think it's punishment. We think we done messed up. You think, you know, oh, God. no, he's just positioning you maybe to hear now. How do you make that horse do what you want to do? You got to break that rascal, right? Some of us need broke, right? Look at verse 9, Revelation 1. Here you go. He says, I, John, both your brother and companion, companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus. I was on the island that is called Patmos. Why was he there? Not because he was in trouble, but he was there for the word of God and the testimony of who? Jesus Christ. He said he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He heard behind him a loud voice like a trumpet. Jesus speaking to him. If you've got a red letter edition Bible, you'll see that Jesus says, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write it in a book and send it to the seven churches that are in Asia. And he names those churches right there. Okay, he's got his marching orders, right? Okay, so, so chapters 2 and chapters 3, and we've already studied these, are letters to churches. Okay, each individual church Jesus is writing to these churches. Now, is he just writing to them, or is he writing to all the church? He's writing to all the church, okay? Now, each church got a copy of every letter to every church, but also they got a, they got a copy of the, Re, the book of Revelation, the scroll of Revelation, so, so the end time prophecy. So every church got, got the letters from the churches. In other words, they got what we got right here. Revelation, right here. They got what we got. Okay? Why did he send it to those seven cities, those seven churches? Because it was the only ones that had a, post, had, had a postman. Only one where the postman come with his short shorts on. Right? 
and the dog get after them. Right? Okay. That's the only way you can get the word out back in the day. They didn't have the FaceTime. They didn't have the email and all that. All right? He sent it to the churches. Why? To get it out to the world. And did it? Is it successful? Yes. We, we all got probably many copies. Okay? So, when you look at the book of Revelation, chapter 1 is an intro. Chapters 2 and 3 are letters to the churches. Chapter 4 is going to... We've been looking at that. It's, it's, it's John in the throne room telling us what he looks like in the throne room. But when you get to chapter 5 and you go forward, it's end times prophecy. It's end times prophecy. Something that has not happened yet. Okay? And, and, and how do we believe that it's going to happen? Because we go back and look at all the other prophecy that was fulfilled. That fires us up. Is this making sense to everybody so far? All right. Now, these letters to the churches, they were all different. Okay. One of them, he didn't have anything bad to say about them. But one of them, he had nothing good to say about them. But one thing about these letters to the churches that they all had in common was this right here. Look at Revelation 3, verse 22. And this is at the end of every one of these these letters. So if this is the one thing that they had in common, we need to get a hold of this, right? Okay, real simple. Verse 22, what does it say? He who has an ear, let him hear what Raymond has to say to you. What? Spirit said, is it a capital S or a small s? It's a capital S. Why is it a capital S? Because it's talking about the Holy Spirit of God. The only way you're going to ever understand anything in these letters, anything in this book of Revelation, the Spirit of God's got to teach us, y'all. Is this making sense? We won't hear a thing without the Spirit t- teaching us. So here, his prayer after every letter, oh, please hear what I'm saying, church. He who has an ear, let him hear. That's what he's saying. And we can say that today after, after this message. He who has an ear, let him hear. Do you got an ear to hear? Because, see, I didn't for a long time. I was hearing what I wanted to hear. I was hearing, I was waiting to hear, I'm going to close. Amen. And then I knew the chicken wasn't, wasn't far after that. Right? That's what I was looking for when I was, used to be in church, right? But, but listen, I, I needed to hear what all was before that that was coming out of that word. Yeah. What I needed to hear. Okay, whole revelation. We'll be back later. All right? And go to John 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Same John. All right. Now, we ain't discounting John. Jesus spoke through John. But let me just show you what John says. And church, I want you to get a hold of this. What did verse 22 say? He who has an ear, let him hear. What the who? What the Spirit said to the church. The the work of the Holy Spirit is so important. We got to quit discounting that. God is in three persons. He's three-cylinder. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Ghost. Okay? What is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Ghost? It's real simple. It's God's Spirit. God's Spirit can be everywhere at one time in everybody knowing everything. And outside of time, all at the same time. Now, if you can figure that out, you know, you're the man or the woman. Okay. What is the Holy Spirit usually called? It's called like counselor, helper, things like that. Well, listen to me. Part of that help and part of that counsel, get a hold of this word, is conviction. Conviction. He is there to convict us in a good way. Okay? Let's read this. John 16, starting in verse 7. John 16, starting in verse 7. Jesus says, he's talking to his disciples, he's talking to us today. He says... Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. He says, it is your advantage that I go away. They don't realize he's going to be crucified and he's going to be buried, but he's going to get up three days later and he's going to ascend to heaven, right? So he's telling them, guys, it's your advantage that I go away because if I don't go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I'll send the helper to you, right? All right, think about it. Think about it. Why is he saying it's a benefit to have the helper and not have Jesus there? Because Jesus in the flesh is one man, right, in one spot. But the Spirit of Jesus can be in everybody, all the believers at one time, and always at work. Tell me what's more effective. Okay, so he said, it's to your advantage that I go, because if you're not right beside me, and you need to know what to do, and, and I don't have, hey, Jesus doesn't have a phone number, 
right? And, or you can't catch Jesus, right? But you have his spirit with you all the time. The problem is we drag him into some nasty places. Uh-oh. So it says, verse 8, when he's come, he's going to watch this. Here's the work of the Holy Spirit. If you've ever wanted to know what the work of the Holy Spirit is, it's right here. Write it in your Bible. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin, convict the world of righteousness, and convict the world of judgment. Now, before you say, what does all that mean? He's going to tell us. All right? But get a hold of that word, conviction. Conviction. Have you ever touched something that was hot? When something hot hits your nerve in your body, what do you do? Ow! Look out now! Right? What, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, uh, me and Damon were fishing the other day, and before we went fishing, I, I buried a fish hook all the way up. What happened when that fish hook hit a nerve? Ow! Right? Right? And old, old Damon, he, we, go, we get in there in the sink, and he jerked that thing out. Thank the Lord for Damon. Didn't even feel it, man. That man's like a physician. He's a coach, but he can be a doctor too. Anyway, conviction is like a nerve. Conviction is like a nerve. Listen, church, we got, we got to have our nerves. How, how sad would it be, you know, if you're standing up next to something hot and, and, and oh, my leg just melted off. <laughs> you, if you didn't have nerves, you wouldn't know. Is, is this being real? Is it, okay. Hey man, did, did you realize like there's a there's a you got two cotton mouths hanging off your leg? You don't say what'd you say? My goodness, I sure do. We need to know you got cotton mouths hanging off your leg. Okay, well, how do you know that? Nerves, right? Okay, okay, you got it, you got it. All right, same thing in our spiritual walk. We don't know when the devil's biting us. We don't know when it's going no, go, or whatever if those nerves of the conviction is not preaching to us and speaking to us like, Scotty, don't go there. Uh-uh, don't do that. Whoa, ho, 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 ho. Conviction. Conviction. It's spiritual nerves. If you're taking notes, right, conviction is spiritual nerves. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Let's watch it. Verse 9. He's going to explain this. He comes, he convicts in three ways. One, of sin. He convicts the sin because cause, cause folks don't believe in him. Okay, what does that mean? It means when we get outside of the boundaries of God, he, he, he's going to say, oh, 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 hold up right there. Don't sin. Don't, don't get into that. Don't cuss them out. All right? Don't look at that. All right? D don't rely on taking that and, 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 and to be and feel however. You, you follow what I'm saying? He, 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 whoa, 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 stop there. But here's the thing. We keep doing it so long, we just dull that, that conviction. And that's a dangerous place to be. Okay, so he convicts of sin, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. Then he says he convicts of righteousness because he's going to the Father. You're not going to see me anymore. Remember what righteousness is. It's the standard. In other words, he's gone. We need a helper. You need a help every day. We can, it'd be nice if we all went together every day. Hey, watch out. Don't do that. Watch out. It'd be good. You know, it'd be nice if, you know, that's why mamas and, is so skittish of letting their kids go to school because they're right there with them, you know, and, and if, when they get away from them, they're afraid they don't have that, that voice of reason. That's why first day of school so tough. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. It's going to be okay. Mama, mama be right here when you get out, you know. That's what we do. But here's the thing, we have the helper, we have Jesus that will continue to let us know what is right and what is wrong. I was telling you about the mailbox, we had the mailbox, I thought it looked straight, it, my son thought it looked straight, we thought it was straight till we put the level on it. But there's a way that seems right to a man that will lead you to death, right? He convicts us of righteousness. Next one he says, he says... He, he, uh, he convicts us of judgment that the ruler of this world is judged. What does that mean? Here's what he means. Don't get all stirred up about that devil. Don't give the devil all the credit. He's judged. He's defeated. He's done. We overcome because he overcome. He has to remember that. We can get down. That old devil's busy. That old devil's busy. Yeah, he may be busy, but lay him off. Lay him off. He, all he is is an out-of-work angel. That's all he is. 
He, he only has a job because we give him a job. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. He's like, I'll go to work on that. I'll show you what to do. You know what I'm saying? No, man, lay his butt off. Say, mm-mm, mm-mm, I ain't hiring. I ain't hiring. Jesus is Lord here. Is this making sense to anybody? Okay, let's keep reading. I still have many things I want to say, Jesus. He said, but y'all can't handle them right now. But he says, however, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into this truth. We need a guide. He's our helper. He's our convictor. He's our guide. And listen, so you're not worried about he's going to say something that Jesus wouldn't say. Notice this. He's not going to speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he'll speak, and he'll tell you of the things to come. Uh Uh-oh. Things to come. What does that mean? Revelation. Revelation. Things to come. Revelation. Things to come. He's, he just said, you, you, you guys can't handle it right now. He's talking to the disciples. Y'all can't handle it right, right now. But when the Spirit comes, He can share the truth with you. And this is how we learn the Scripture. The Holy Spirit is the key to understanding the end times. Amen. All right, I told you we was going to review a little bit. Okay, let's go, let's go back to Revelation. Now let's go on the rabbit trail. Y'all good with that? All right, let me baptize my throat. Anybody ever followed a rabbit trail? You ever notice how the rabbit just come right back around where he was? If you rabbit hunting and you spook one, just stand right there. He'll make a loop, come back. You be eating fried rabbit. Hey, that's what the Lord put him here for. Too bad, Bug Bunny. All right. <laughs> now I ain't talking about the ones you got in the cages at the house. That's there when times get tough. I'm talking about them wild rabbits. Them wild rabbits will bite you. They'll scratch you. You got to stand up for yourself. Okay, here we go. Y'all ready? Okay. <laughs> Please. Chapter 4. Now, you got to realize we were, we were here last week, right here. Chapter 4. Okay. John says, after these things... Behold, I saw a door standing open in heaven. He heard a ver- voice that sounded like a trumpet saying, Come up here, and I will show you things that's got to take place after this. Okay, what did we say just happened after these things? We, okay, he just lo- wrote the letter to the churches. Okay, listen to me. You don't hear of the church anymore. He's telling him to come up. He heard a voice like a trumpet. Church, this is a rapture right here. Okay, remember, last week we studied 1 Thessalonians 4. If you you weren't here, go get the message. Go study 1 Thessalonians 4. It tells you that the Lord's coming back, and the dead in Christ will rise. He won't come all the way to the earth, but he's coming back. He's coming with a shout of a trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise first. Meet, the spirit, meet their spirit in the air. And it says those that remain alive will be, will be caught up and will for, be forever changed with the Lord. Yeah. Now, you say, well, you mean, I'm, mean my folks still buried out there in the ground? Their earth suit is. Their earth suit's in the ground. But their spirit is with the Lord. The scripture says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Your spirit's with the Lord when you, when you die. But your body and your spirit come together at the rapture. And that's when you get a new glorified body that we don't know what it's going to look like, right? We just know there's no pain, no tears, and we can praise and ain't got to sleep. Hey, no more sleep machine. No more of that. Mm. I mean, I'm thankful for it, right? But no more of that. No more hurting. No more going to the doctor. Listen, this is where to shock you. We don't need any faith anymore. What you say? No more faith. Why would you need to be, have faith? You're sitting there looking at them. Have you thought about that? You're sitting there looking at Jesus. Why do you have to have faith in him? You don't. Whoop. There he is, right? Yes, Lord. Okay, so after these things, listen, the church age. The church age is over. Now, last week we went through the dispensations and the ages of the Bible. The church age started at Pentecost. 
Okay, Pentecost was when Jesus promised to send back the helpers, send back his spirit on the day of Pentecost. That's, that's when the, the spirit of God fell on all the believers. And any believer that gives his life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live within them. So the church age goes from Pentecost to the rapture. Okay, and if you notice in the scripture, we hadn't got to the tribulation yet. So if the church is gone before the tribulation, that ought to tell you. He's not going to take his church through wrath. He's not going to take his bride through wrath. We looked at the Jewish wedding last week. We saw how that goes. It lays out perfect, doesn't it? Lays out perfectly the heart of the Lord. So church, gone. Okay? Church is gone. And go again, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and read all that. So here's the, here's the rabbit trail I want to go on. And we need to know this moving forward. I want to show you the difference between the church and Israel. Now, before you think that's some boring Bible study, it's not. Okay? <laughs> we need to know this. Didn't we, didn't we say we're going to study the book of Revelation? We need to know this. Because church is gone. Church, the church age, the age of the church, which is what we're in right now, the age of grace, the age of the church, church is gone. Then the Lord will turn His face back towards Israel to, to win them back, basically. And we're going to get into all that. Okay, but let's set the standard. Let's talk about Israel first. Can we do that? Go to Genesis 12. We're going, we're going to just jump through this. We're going to flip some Bible today, okay? Y'all good with that? When you flip, you find out where it is. Unless you got one of your doodads, and you can push on that, and Lord bless you. One of them things. Yeah. Okay. After the flood... Y'all remember about the flood? Noah, Noah built an ark. All right? Only him and his family, the only righteous people on the earth, took all animals, two by two, male and female. If you'd have had two males, it wasn't going down. Two females, it wouldn't have happened. Male and female, should I say any more? All right? Go look at your water hose outside. Anyway, <laughs> after the flood, the people started repopulating, right? Started coming together. But then they started like wanting to be like God, building the tower towards God. But he scattered them, made them all talk different languages. You know, the Pekingese, remember I was telling you about that? Some spoke Pekingese, some spoke whatever, Japanese. Anyway, American, country, Texas, hello, how y'all doing? Okay, they scattered, right? Well, in the scatter, God comes to a man named Abraham... Because he sees people going off again. He sees them going after little G-gods, going after their own things. He said, you know what? I'm going to make me a nation. But to make a nation, you got to start with a man, right? Okay, did you go to Genesis 12? Look at verse 1. The Lord comes down to Abram. He says, listen to me, brother. He says, get out of your country. Get away from your family. Get all away from your father's house to a land that I'm going to show you. Look, listen to this promise, y'all. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to be a blessing. Anybody that blesses you, I'm going to bless them. And I'm going to curse those who curse you. Watch what he says. That in you, in you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What you say? Really? Okay. Okay. Hang on. There's a, there's, a life, there's a life application here, though. God had to get him away from some folk. <laughs> God had to get him away from some folk that was having bad influence on him. Right? Why? So he could use him. Right? So he could use him. I, I just wonder if that is us today, if God's trying to get us away from some things so he can use us. Because he can't use us like we are, right? So God wanted a nation. He wants a nation. He wants a people that is after his heart. Okay? Through Abraham. Abraham finally had a, ch a child in his 90s. You know? Even though Sarah's oven wasn't breaking bread anymore, God did a miracle power. Right? You'll figure that one out after, later. All right? He, she, they had a little boy. boy named Isaac. Little Isaac. Right? Isaac grows up. All right, you got Abraham, now you got Isaac. Isaac grows up, he has a boy named Jacob. Now here you got Abraham, he's a, he's a super great granddaddy, a great granddaddy. And then you got Isaac, right, now you got Jacob. Okay, Jacob 
God comes to him, changes his name to Israel. All right? Israel, Jacob, has 12 boys. All right? These 12 boys are the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? So if you are... Trace your family tree back to any of those 12 tribes. That would make you a Hebrew. That would make you a Jew or Israelite. Make sense? Okay. That is the nation of Israel. Okay. They're known as Jews. They're known as Hebrews, Israelites. Okay. Now, when you look at the, the history of Israel, from this point on, it gets pretty tough. Remember, they go into bondage of Egypt. Then that's where we get Moses. Moses leads them. God uses Moses to lead them out of Egypt, out of the bondage, across the Red Sea. God parted the sea. You remember all that. Into the wilderness and into a land, which we just read in Genesis 12, that is there. It's a promised land full of pomegranates, man. Don't you know when they run over there and got to come back with bananas and apple juices dropping out of their mouth? Say, ooh, it's good over here. It's good over here. But then some of them said, there's giants, there's giants, we can't go over there. And the guys with the pomegranate said, yes, we can. And that's a whole other story. We can go into that another time. God said, go take it. After that, they go into the bondage of Babylon. They go through that mess. Then they go under Roman law, right? Then they're scattered. And then in 1948, prophecy right before your eyes, in 1948, Israel becomes a nation again. Come on, somebody. Don't be, don't, Israel, when you hear anything with Israel, you, 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 you better ding, 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 listen to that. Okay? Quit thinking America is the hub. America is not the hub. Jerusalem is. It's Israel. Okay? It's right here in the Scripture. All right? Now, backtracking to when, 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 when Israel was under the law, something incredible happens. God steps out of heaven, wraps himself in flesh, and born of a woman. Mary, Joseph, remember that? Christmas, way before Santa Claus. All right? <laughs> God, Son, Jesus, wrapped in flesh. What is he doing? Well, there's been prophecies throughout Israel that a Messiah was coming to save them. Right? Here he is. The Messiah comes. The one they prophesied about. One they promises 4,000 years. you got to remember, God prophesied this thing back in Genesis 3 when he looked at the uh, devil and he said, there, uh, there will be seed out of a woman that will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. This is him right now, born in a manger. Nasty old goat stall. Right there. King of kings, God in the flesh, born in a goat stall. And, 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 and I know it's not Christmas. But the problem, they see this baby, they see this baby grow up, and all they say is that's Joseph's son. They don't believe he's the Messiah. Think about it. Your hero has just stepped onto the scene and you don't even recognize him. The giver of life itself and you don't recognize him. Can we go to Luke 4 now? I'm going to show you. Let's do a little flipping. Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke 4. Are y'all into this? Okay, Luke 4. Let me show you something. I'll show you something right here. I'm, Jesus, is, I'll just, we'll just map it out right here. Who's the Messiah? Jesus. Okay. Luke chapter 4, starting in about verse 16. You've got to realize Jesus was 30 years old before he claimed to be the Messiah. Okay? He was a little old boy just like, just like the other guy's little old boys. Cutting up, carrying on. One time, though, one time, they got a glimpse of who he really is. One time, his mom and daddy left, left him in town on the way home. How do you lose the Son of God? I'm serious. I mean, you may lose your french fries out of your McDonald's sack, but how in the world are you going to lose the Son of God, you know? And when they finally come back to town, where'd they find him? Was he on the, was he on the swing set? Was he on the slides? No. Where was he? In the church, he was in, he was in the temple. And, and what did they say? Jesus, where you been? He says, I'm about my father's business, baby. <laughs> they should have known then, you know what I mean? So watch what he does in verse 16. Now, this, is, this is Jesus, 30 years old. He came to Nazareth. Everybody there, Luke 4, 16? Where he had been brought up. 
And his custom was to go to church on a Sabbath, and he stood up and read. And they handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is the prophet that spoke about Jesus. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. You ready? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, freedom to the captives, recovery of the sight of the blind, to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Salvation has come. Hallelujah. So what did he do? Verse 20. Closed the book, sat down, gave it back to the attendant. Everybody's eyes was on him like, preach Jesus. That was good, little son, little boy. You know, he's 30 years old. Still call him little boy. And he began to say, watch this, church. Verse 21 is so powerful. I couldn't imagine being there this day. Jesus looked at them intently. He said, boy, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am here. Don't you know? Oh, oh man, hallelujah. Our Messiah is here. Yes, 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 yes. Watch verse 22. All bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words that proceeded out of his half mouth. But here's what they come up with. Is this not Joseph's son? Ah, that's that old boy fixed my coffee table the other day. That's the guy that power washed my driveway the other day. That's old Joseph's boy. You know what I'm saying, you know, down there. Let me put this one on the screen. Matthew 27, verse 37 says this. He said this. He said, there it is. See it? There it is. No. Is that it? No. I'm going to read it. I got it right here. 23. Uh, Matthew 23. He says, oh, Jerusalem. Listen to it. Listen to his heart. Oh, Jerusalem. He's, he's crying for him. He says, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who sent to her. Listen to what he says. How often. I think of you. How often did I want to gather you together like a hen does her chicks? Think about it. You ever seen a, seen a hen get, to get them babies under, get them under there real tight like that? Me and Cody were driving by this real pe pretty piece of property down here on Country Club Road down there, and, and we saw a little fawn. This was a few months ago. A little bitty, little bitty rascal, barely could walk. I mean, he's a spaghetti legs, right? He's coming, she's, that little thing coming across that pasture. And, uh, and, 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 and he saw us, the car, and he stopped, and that joker just got down real close to the ground like that, and Mama just come laid on him like that. Boy, her ears were looking at us like, mm-mm, don't be coming over here. That's what that Mama Chicken does. She, Mama Chicken gets her. And see, that's what Jesus wants to do, get under the shadow of his wing. He said, I would have brought you together if you'd have believed in me. But he said, you weren't willing. And he goes on to say that your house, house is left desolate. How sad is that, church? How sad is that? Let, let me take you to another place. Matthew 27. Y'all got time? Let's go to Matthew 27. Oh, church, this is good stuff, man. I guess not. Hey, thank you, Pete. This stuff doesn't fire you up. Your wood is wet. Matthew 27, let's start in verse 15. I'm showing you that they're rejecting Jesus. Okay? And there's, I'm, I'm leading to something here. Man, I'm already out of time, man. Thank you. Okay. Matthew 27. How, how is it already this late? Okay, listen, i got to get through this. So the Feast of the Governor, listen to this, was accustomed to releasing a, 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 a prisoner who they wished. And at that time, there, well, look at these words. There was a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Okay. Therefore, they had gathered together, and Pilate and them was talking. and says, hey, do we want to release to you Barabbas or Jesus? Because Jesus has been arrested. Who's called the Christ? For they knew that they handed him over because of envy. But while he was sitting in judgment, uh, Pilate's wife says, hey, don't have anything to do with him. He says, for, she says I've suffered many things today in a dream because of him. 
But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. What? We're talking about your Messiah. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release? And they said, Barabbas. Are you kidding me? Jump to verse 26. So they released Barabbas and they scourged Jesus. That's tied to a whipping post and beaten beyond human resemblance. They stripped him. Verse 29 said they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head. A reed in his right hand, he bowed the knee and they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, verse 30. They struck him on the head. They mocked him. Verse 31, took off his robe, put clothes on him, led him away to be crucified. Can you imagine, church? Can you imagine? Picture this. Who, who is really Barabbas? Barabbas is a notorious killer. He needs to be locked up and he needs to die. But they let him go and Jesus took his place. Who is that? That's me and you. We're Barabbas, but we walk away while he, Jesus gets scourged. How sad is that? How sad is that? Go to Galatians 3 right quick. Galatians 3. So, watch this. Since the Jews have rejected, since Israel has rejected Jesus, then what's God going to do? Are you an Israelite? Are you from the 12 tribes of Israel? Okay, Salvation was for them. The Messiah was coming for them. you got to get this, church. Jesus came for them. You in Galatians yet? Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. It's written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Watch this. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit too. Wait a minute. What's a Gentile? A Gentile is a non Jew, basically a dog, an unbeliever. Okay, now Jesus has come for the Gentiles. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Look at verse 29. If you are Christ, are you? Then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Mm -mm -mm. Isn't that a blessing? Okay, Let me, I'm just going to tell you this next story for time's sake. This is in Luke 14. Write it down. Go look at it later. In Luke 14, all right, it's the picture of a wedding feast. All right, picture of a wedding feast. Gather together, Israel, bring the Jews in. Let's go celebrate the wedding. But then when the servants go out, one of them said, You know, I bought a piece of land. I got to go look at it. I ain't, I ain't coming to the wedding. Nothing said, I bought some, some cows, and now i got to go see them. Who buys cows without seeing them? Okay. And then the next guy, this is the only one that had a legitimate excuse. He says, uh, I'm getting married. Well, go on ahead, brother. So the, so the, so the, so the main guy of the wedding feast said, well, man, since y'all ain't coming, I'm going to send my servants out to the highways and the byways, to the hedges, to the street corners, in the booth, in the back, all of that. Bring everybody to my wedding. Church, that's us. That's us right there. Do you realize what a blessing that is? Let me read these in Romans 11. We can do them on the screen. Romans 11, verse 11. Don't miss this. He says, I say then, they have stumbled that they should fall. Certainly not. He's talking about Israel. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Uh-oh. Verse 23. 
And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Verse 24. For if you were cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into the olive tree? Verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come. Go on YouTube. Watch the grafting process. You got a tree that's cut off. Think about a smaller tree. And he will bring this. I was watching a guy do an apple tree. There were three root stocks sticking out of the ground. He trimmed them rascals like a, like a sharp sword and put some notches in it. Brought three different limbs from three different kinds of apple trees. You know, different like honey crisp, regular old red granny apples, and some other... Polynesian soup hound kind. Okay? He joined, grafted them things into this other tree that was cut off. In six months, that thing started bearing fruit. This kind of apple come off of this, this kind of apple come off of this, and this kind of apple come off of that. What you say. Can you believe that something can be cut off of somewhere else and be grafted into the roots of Jesus and bear fruit from the original rootstock. Church, that's heavy. What God had sent for the Jews, He made offering to us. He grafted us in just like those apple limbs. It's a beautiful thing. We, didn't, we were lost without Him. Do you understand that? So we make up the church. The Gentiles makes up the church. So the church age comes to end in Revelation 3. Jesus calls us up to the marriage supper with him. Church, that age is coming, and it's coming quickly. It's coming quickly. So speaking of the Jewish nation, look on the screen. Hosea said this. I'll return to my place until they acknowledge their offense, and they will seek my face in their affliction. Isn't that beautiful? They'll seek him again. Now, we're going to see a lot more of that in the weeks to come. But I'll close. I'll close with Revelation 4, and we're done right here. <laughs> Let's just go through it, so that way we can pick it up on chapter 5. So after these things, in verse 1, he saw the door standing open, and he sees this vision. He heard a voice that said, come up here, I'll show you these things that much take place. Immediately he was in the spirit. He was before the throne, set in heaven, one who sat in there. He was looking at Jesus. Can you imagine? Verse 3 said, He who sat there was like Jasper, Sardis. There was a rainbow around the throne. In the appearance of like emerald. Remember what I was telling you all that? He's trying to describe Jesus as lights, colors, and noises. It's It's amazing. Verse 4 said, around the throne were 24 thrones, and on those 24 thrones were 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they all had crowns on their heads. These are representatives of the church. And in the throne proceeded lightning, thundering voices, seven lamps of fire burning the throne, which are seven spirits of God. There's seven things that we read earlier, seven anointings. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne, around the throne. Listen, there's four living creatures. You need to know about these four living creatures because they're full of eyes front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like a calf. The third was like the face of a man. The fourth was like an eagle, like a flying eagle. And it says the four living creatures each have six wings full of eyes. They're all around, and they do not rest day or night. They sing unto the Lord. Listen, these are cherubim angels. These are beautiful, amazing-looking cherubim angels. But the symbolism here is amazing. You think about those four faces. The lion, that's, your, that's the strong, wild things. The calf, the ox, that's your stuff that's service, strong, some stuff, animals that we can work with. Man, what is man? That's the pinnacle of creation, intelligent man. Then you got the eagle that represents all the flying creatures. Here's what he's saying. Those cherubim represent creation. 
And it sh- it's a picture when they're in there saying in verse 8, holy, 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 past, present, and future. When you see holy, holy three times like that, holy, holy, holy means past, present, and future. It means that all the earth, all creation, it's a picture of them celebrating Jesus in the throne room. I know that was quick, fast, and a hurry, but that's what it means. That's what it means. It's a beautiful, beautiful scene. Verse, where are we at? Nine. Whenever the living creatures were giving glory and thanks to him who sat on the throne, who lives forever, then the 24 elders would stand up. They would fall before the Lord. Everybody cast their crowns saying, You are worthy, Lord, to receive glory, honor, power. For you created all things. And by your will they exist and were created. This is just beautiful. These, when these angels get to praising God, these elders fall down and start praising God. So here's what I'm saying. I'm done. Does an angel need forgiveness and redemption? Okay. Does an angel need the blood of Jesus to cover their sin? Okay. All right. Who does? We do. How in the world are we going to let an angel out praise us then? Uh Uh-huh. That's right. We, not that we ain't, got, we ain't got nothing against angels. I'm not trying to build a defense against angels. <laughs> I'm just showing you we need to be praising like they are. They're singing holy, holy, holy day and night. They're falling on their face and saying worthy of the Lord. When's the last time we done that? See, Luke 7, 47 says those that love much will forgive much. Or those that have been forgiven will love much. Those that have been forgiven for a lot will love a lot more than somebody that, you know, has only been forgiven of a little. So if the angels have never needed the blood, if they never needed forgiveness and never needed redemption, and they're praising the Lord day and night, what are we doing? What are we doing? Amen? If you would, bow your heads. Ah, Lord. Forgive us for getting worried about other things. Forgive us for when we take our eyes off of you. Forgive us when you're a side deal, something we just do on Sundays and Wednesdays every once in a while. Lord, I thank you that you gave us an opportunity. You gave us an opportunity to serve you. You gave us an opportunity by adopting us into your family. To call us Abraham's seed and we not even kin to him. But you still call us sons and daughters. That blows my natural mind. It's beautiful to see an earthly family when they adopt a child that's not part of their blood. Lord, that's just a picture of you. Because you care for all of us. You love all of us. You died for us. You gave us hope. You gave us a future. You gave us joy. You gave us peace, Lord. Thank you. So, Lord, I just pray today for those that may have lost sight. I pray for those that may be in a situation around a group of people that they need to get away from it so you can use them, so you can get their attention, so you can speak to them. Lord, I pray for those that may be whining and complaining, but you, but you got them right where they need to be to hear from you. Lord, please forgive us for not trusting you. Lord, you're the one that works all things together for good. We're not. We can't work anything. Lord, I thank you for your spirit. 
Thank you for your help, your counsel, your strength. Thank you for your conviction. Oh, Lord, we love you. God, I pray you put a passion in our heart again. A passion that's going to bleed off onto our kids and our grandkids. Go set a fire on them. Lord, your word says, any house built that's not on your foundation is in vain. Lord, if we need to rebuild today, we need to recommit, get on you for sure. Anybody may have slid off his foundation. Lord, bring us back. Bring us back. Father, I thank you for each and every person here today. I thank you for how you challenge us, how you love us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. If you would stand. We're going to take a moment. We're going to sing one song, another song. If you want to get out of your comfort zone and come and pray, man, do it. I know it used to really help me to get out of my comfort zone and kind of get alone and pray. It'll help you to, 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 to maybe go over there to somebody you love, somebody you're with, and just take time and pray with them. Somebody been heavy on your heart and they're here today. Go, go pray with them. Husbands, you're the leader of your family. Maybe it's time to finally grab your wife and bring her up here and pray for her and pray for your family. Maybe things will start going a little better at the house because a praying house is a powerful house because a praying house is putting Jesus first. Praying ain't embarrassing. It's the most powerful thing you can do, my friend. So listen to that still, small voice. 